the Rotary Clubs of uh, Montana and Alberta came up with this clever idea of, hey, let's celebrate the fact that Canada and the United States has this really peaceful relationship with one another. Let's see if we can get the two parks to be joined as Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. So the United States government and the Canadian government actually really rapidly, because it only took up a year, uh, ended up proclaiming uh, both simultaneously that this would be forever known as Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. Both the uh, U.S. and the Canadian government uh, said, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Let's, let's make this an international peace park. And it was the first international peace park. Hello, my name is uh, White Eagle. My English name is uh, John Davis. 20, 20 years old. I've been living on the Blackfeet Reservation all my life here in uh, good old Browning, Montana. I'm just getting my generals done here, and then I'm off to either Bozeman or Missoula uh, to get my degree in either environmental engineering or political science. I guess I can speak as a mother. Um, I have three children. One's 19, 14, and eight. And so when I take my family into the park, you know, I, I teach them about um, this place as your place, as our place. As a parent, I've done that because my parents did that for me. And so I am sharing with my children, the next generation, that this place is for them. They come up here and practice their traditional religion. They've probably been coming here for thousands of years um, to this exact site where we're standing today. and That's what makes uh, <clears throat> this area so significant. Look around, you see a lot of the offerings and the trees. And, and that's, you know, that's just, you know, we're talking to our spirits. This is kind of the spirit area. It's our church, I guess, for our, our people. My father took us up into the park to picnic every Sunday, you know. I mean, when he'd go out there, he would tell us the names of these mountains and, you know, what chief came through this way and this and that. And, she, you know, we still go up there. I think that's my job as a Blackfoot person to say, these places are important. This is what we know about these places so that they in the future will be able to tell their children and carry on those types of um, stories and the importance of this place to us as Blackfeet people. Glacier National Park uh, originally when it was created, prior to the national park being established, there was a forest reserve here on the east side. So if you take the Continental Divide that we can see in the background, uh, everything that's now park on the other side, that was part of this forest reserve. Well, prior to it being a forest reserve, it was Blackfeet land. This area has been historically used by the Blackfeet for millenniums of time. We know now through archeological research that they've revealed all these um, artifacts, lithics, things that they've located in the park, in the very high top mountainous parts, indicating that there has been continual use for um, you know, thousands of years. I'm glad it's a, a refuge, refuge for wildlife and whatnot. And, uh, but you know, my Blackface side saying, you know, screw that, you know, they, they tricked us out of that land, you know? The treaties are, are a documentation of of America's uh, wrath upon Native Americans, you know. It's a history of how Native Americans uh, became assimilated and extinct to a certain extent. A lot of our people, I guess, at the time understood it as, as being a 99-year lease. But today, being 2010, that lease would have been up that 99 year, and it was an actual sale. There were people at the table with the Blackfeet that should have been able to communicate very well um, the intent of this agreement. They wanted the rocks, you know, the mountains, 
and at this time there was a push for um, the minerals up in the parks. And that's what the chiefs are asking for. We will sell you the, the rocks, you know, but, you know, we need to continue to, you know, get the resources there, you know, get the roots, you know, go up there and do the praying, do the vision quests. So that's when pretty much, you know, our boundaries were beginning to shrink. First article of the agreement, there are three reserved rights that the Blackfeet have. The right to enter, the right to gather timber, the right to hunt and fish. I think the only right we have now to go on there is, you know, we can go pond land without paying. Uh, we can fish, but we can no longer hunt, get timber. Um, we can't gather any of the, the roots, you know, berries or anything like that. The artificial lines we've drawn down there are not something that either culture that existed before or wildlife that existed before paid any attention to. And so it's really a matter of trying to untangle this concept we've laid out, the way we've organized our thinking and, and the society that has arrived here after these uh, other cultures and, and populations were in place to try and restore that connectivity. Yeah, the border's kind of interesting. I don't think a lot of people realize that by treaty, there's actually a big 30-foot wide swath that's cleared every 10 years. And uh, so, you know, if you're a human and you go by, you look up and you go, hey, what is that big line on the hill where you can see all the trees are gone? You know, the, the plants and animals doesn't mean a thing to them. And they migrate back and forth all the time. The cultural identity of the tribes um, is a strong one that's existed for many, many millennia. We've laid over top of that a border, and now following 9-11, we've laid on top of that a heavy level of border security, much greater than there ever was before, which has essentially produced a kind of artificial separation between branches of the Blackfeet Confederacy. And so uh, that cultural identity tied to the land has actually been disrupted by our laying down of these administrative lines. Well, Glacier National Park is, you know, not in isolation. So the wildlife, the vegetation, nothing stops at the boundary. Everything crosses and the ecosystem certainly doesn't stop at the boundary. So in order to understand the workings of the entire ecosystem, it's important to study both sides and that gives us a broader picture of what's going on in the Peace Park. Both parks have come to a realization probably more quickly than uh, some of the other agencies of the need to manage beyond their borders or to at least engage in what's happening beyond their borders. And so those two parks have been leaders in trying to move this process of a larger collaborative approach to land management forward. What's going on in Canada uh, tells us a lot about our populations down in the States. We have bighorn sheep populations that are connected. We've done a lot of transboundary work with the fisheries. And so these researchers are working on both sides I think a lot of times people think that because it's an international peace park that the, both parks are managed jointly. And that's not really true. Waterton Lakes National Park manages uh, their park through Parks Canada. Glacier National Park is managed through the United States National Park Service. But there's a number of areas where uh, those naturally just have to overlap. Every year since the park was uh, established, uh, the Rotarians in the United States and Canada get together. Part of that process is uh, where they gather along the international border and uh, reach across, shaking hands once again, signifying that um, 
you know, this, this, is, a, this is an artificial barrier uh, and that uh, with our cooperation uh, as Rotarians and as with citizens of the world, uh, you know, we can reach across this border. Well, my dream actually is to clean Willow Creek. I want to get involved with uh, some of the, the other seven campuses on the, on, in the state of Montana, the seven reses. Like it would be so awesome if uh, each campus had a serve or had a site, had a, had a specific project, and each reservation would go to that site, and we would all help out, and then so on for the other reservation, and you know so forth. You know, you could kind of create a sort of a annual thing there of all these reservations coming together in Montana and helping each other out. So I want to see if I could actually, if I could do a couple of projects and I could make some kids look and say, hey, you know, shit, let's join them. You know, we could probably do the same thing that he's doing. So the next generation is going to have to think about how do we keep what the values are that are here that are in place that we want to keep and how do we sustain that for their children on into the future. So they're going to have to engage in these issues in a world of growing population, um, decreasing resources, uh, limits on the use of fossil fuels, uh, a kind of whole new place setting for the table, if you will, that they're going to have to figure out how to arrange and which fork to use first. One of the things I would hope is that the parks continue to be uh, not only uh, working well with each other, but having the, the citizens of our two nations value what we have here. That we don't become these isolated islands with uh, disjointed management outside the park. We understand there's a boundary here, but we also understand that that's an artificial boundary and it impacts us, but only to the point that we let it impact us. And that's what makes Glacier Waterton International Peace Park such an amazing place.